the Scaper Suite from Igor Vasiliev. Let's complete the set by taking a look at Soundscaper. Now, Soundscaper is reminiscent of Synthscaper and Fieldscaper, and of the two it's more similar to Fieldscaper. In fact, there's quite a crossover between Fieldscaper and Soundscaper in terms of the functionality on offer. Uh, and that's really because they're based essentially on, I, I suspect, the same core functions. It seems to me that Fieldscaper is an evolution of Soundscaper and it can do things that Soundscaper can't do. Notably, Fieldscaper is a universal app and Soundscaper isn't, so it won't run on your iPhone. And you can't use Soundscaper as a live effect as you can with Fieldscaper. But apart from that, by and large, the two apps do similar things. So what does this app do? Well, it's a sound processing app, and I'm saying that to distinguish it particularly from Synthscaper. Synthscaper is a music app, if you like. It's designed to create music. All of the apps in the Scaper suite are based on samples. Um, we have three sample-based oscillators, we'll call them. That's the terminology Igor uses. They're not oscillators. I will continue to point out they're noise makers, if you like, based on playing pre-recorded samples. Now, in the case of Synthscaper, those samples can be tuned to a particular pitch, and the pitch can be varied in order to play musical, well, scales, tones, chords, and so on. In Soundscaper, the emphasis is much more just on playback and processing of the, of the native sounds, if you like. They are looped, and then you can essentially do no end of processing of that sound with effects and such as delays, filters, well, and things that don't have names, <laughs> kind, kinds of manipulations that don't have names. So we'll see a lot of that in a moderate amount of detail. What I'll do is I'll take you around this whole app and pretty much point out everything, at least in outline, and then I'll focus in on a couple of things in particular that I've tended to focus on. And hopefully that should give you some scope for, or at least some ideas for starting your own experiments. The first thing to note is if you look at the square that's in the middle of this main screen. This is a, if you've got Synthscaper you'll recognize this, this is a bird's eye view of essentially the, the soundscape in, in 2D. So we've got uh, the listener if you like, your ear is at the bottom center and those three squares or rectangles represent the the three oscillators and you can move them around in 2D space and that will essentially af affect the soundscape in, in two dimensions so you get the left to right stereo panning will vary and also the by moving something closer or further away the the apparent distance and relative distance of the three oscillators will change. Now I'm going to say a bit more about that in a little while as well. Before we move on I want to just talk about something that's at the heart of this app conceptually if you like and that is that uh, if I, in fact if I t temporarily flip over to a different screen. This screen is showing some stuff, let's just say, about one of the oscillators in particular. It's oscillator one. You can see that selection uh, button, set of selection buttons at the top of the screen. Uh, that's oscillator one. And if you look at uh, what's broadly speaking in the middle of the screen toward and slightly left, you've got what looks like a schematic of a microprocessor almost <laughs> or, or an integrated circuit chip and it sort of is and I'm drawing your attention to this because a fundamental design aspect of this application is it simulates in, on some level uh, a low fidelity sound processing chip and actually this and again it shares this in common with Fieldscaper but in Soundscaper and particularly on this screen uh, it's a little bit clearer what is actually being simulated. Now there are some annotations on this diagram towards the center of the screen that suggests this emulates a one megabyte RAM. Uh, when you load a sample into Soundscaper, essentially it down samples that sound sample with a sampling rate of 11 kilohertz. That means it takes 11,000 samples per second. And each of those samples is an eight bit sample. So it's a number between naught and 255 and your sample is stored in that format. Now I said it was low fidelity, 11 kilohertz is about a quarter of the sample rate of CD quality sound, 
and 8 bits is half the quality or the resolution of CD quality sound. So in that sense it's low fidelity. And if you divide 11,000 bytes, that, that means it needs 11,000 bytes per second to store the, the sound sample. And if you divide 11,000 into uh, a megabyte, that comes out at about 90, which is why the maximum length of your sound sample, once it's imported, is about 90 seconds. So it says 95 seconds on there. Now that low fidelity tag really only applies to the source sound if you like, it's the starting point. So when you start the app playing, it retrieves that low fidelity sound. But then of course you can do all sorts of almost infinite, infinitely variable manipulations to it and mix, uh, as I say, there's three oscillators, so you can mix up to three sounds playing back together with all those manipulations applied. Now that processing is done in 16-bit or optionally 24-bit resolution and probably at a much higher sample rate. So you can capture all the nuances and subtleties of the manipulations that you introduce. Okay, that brief aside <laughs> is all I want to say about this screen for now. We'll come back to this in a while. Coming back to this square in the center, this is the 2D soundscape. These are the three oscillators. The other thing that we can see here at the top left of that square and the top right of that square, we've got um, two sliders which are controlling the reverb. So we have reverb within that space. If I just, uh, let me see, if I choose an empty scene, then don't worry about what I'm doing here. If I just go to the sample presets, try that one. That's a good one. Uh, okay, so it's looping that sort of drop sound. Okay, that's a better one to to demonstrate the, the soundscape. If I change some of the, the if I change the two parameters affecting the reverb, that's reflections. This is not very obvious. If I change the space so that seems to get like more enclosed. That seems to get wider. So that's what those two things do. That's pretty much it for the 2D soundscape diagram. In fact, it's not. I'll just tell you one more thing in passing. Although this looks fantastically complex in every screen. In fact, there's three screens. Let me show you. This is the one. Uh, this is one of three main screens. This, this one here is uh, a, the setup of a single oscillator. We've kind of glimpsed that one already. And there's a third main screen, which is called Morphing, which we'll look at again later as well. Now that said, although they look fantastically complex, there's even more complexity hidden behind these. So coming back to our central soundscape, if I double click on oscillator one, we get to drill down. And we have a, an equalizer in there. So if we were to, let me see, if I were to turn on the equalizer, I can cut out some of the frequencies selectively like that. It's not hugely significant. Double click to recenter them. It's not hugely significant on a sample like this, but it's there. Uh, we can turn off that reverb completely, by the way. We can change the reverb algorithm as well. These, oops, these options along the bottom. We can also, we have a, a low pass and a high pass filter specifically for the reverb, which is quite subtle. So it may not be completely obvious what's happening there, but it's there. Um, okay, so that's the 2D soundscape. Above that we've got master volume, which doesn't need any explanation. We've got scene selection. Now a scene is a collection of a complete setup for one or more 
oscillators saved, if you like, as a package. So you can load that, load that in. There's a bunch of presets here, which I want. There's, there's not actually that many presets, which is one, I suppose, shortcoming of this. It'd be nice to have had some um, additional presets loaded in. If I just give you a, a preview of one of these, let's say, let's just choose that one there. They've got weird names that don't seem to have any meaning. So if I click that, we've got a particular layout of those three oscillators on the soundscape. If I just let this run, I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not, not clear whether what that's meant to do or what, what, what that is. If I show you one more. Um, it's very industrial sounding soundscape, but it's multi layered. If I mute in turn oscillator one and then two and then three, you can see it's taking layers out progressively. Uh, I think for now we're just going to go back to that simple empty scene. And then to oscillator one, we'll reload that drop sample. Okay, so what else do we have on this screen? Three independent oscillators. Down the left-hand side, we've got three squares, which from top to bottom are attached to each of those oscillators. So oscillator one is the square at the top left, oscillator two is the middle left, oscillator three is at the bottom left. And you should see that those three are basically, it's, it's a re repetition of the same controls. Incidentally, those three sliders, let's look at the top left uh, control for oscillator one first. Those three sliders are configurable. They are three out of 14 possible sliders. If we go into this screen, if you count those sliders, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You can, through the main setup dialog here, under faders, they're called faders, not sliders, you can choose which of those are displayed under each of those squares on the main screen. Uh, now that's a concession to using this in a, in a performance kind of mode. You can, you can have the things quickly to hand if you want to be playing this live like an instrument. By default, we get something called trigger, pulse, clock, offset, and output level. Output level is just what you'd imagine. It's the volume of that oscillator. And so you can vary independently the three oscillator volumes to mix them in and out, which is helpful. The clock offset, this, again, if you've got Fieldscaper or Synthscaper, this, the, you know, the idea of a clock is really the playback speed and um, you can adjust that in the oscillator setup screen uh, but wherever it's set you have a fine adjust if you like plus or minus under a slider called clock offset which is what we're looking at here. So if, if you followed what I meant there you should predict that if we let this run and I move this left and right the pitch should vary, the playback speed should vary and hence the pitch should vary somewhat. That's getting faster. Uh, okay, there's a difference there. I double tapped it because in Fieldscape, a double tap in centers the slider. In this application, if you double, t double tap any slider, it drills down and brings up a, a sort of detailed settings dialog. So we might as well look at that one here. Um, so you can recenter that manually. These auto buttons are interesting. I'm not convinced this is entirely as flexible as I'd like it to be. If I click auto plus, you can see that slider starts to tick up and it's doing it in increments of 0.5 seconds. This, this slider is a, a time slider, so it's seconds. You can change that to 0.1 seconds or 0.3. Those are the options. The, the thing that makes me think this is not as flexible as it could be, it basically, once it gets to the top, the maximum setting that slider, 
it stops and the variation stops. There is an auto decrement which does exactly what you expect it to do but the same applies it gets to the bottom stop and then the variation ends. What seems to be missing is a kind of a, like a ping pong I think or a wraparound. Wraparound would that make sense? I think ping pong would make more sense <laughs> than a wraparound. But you'll find that if I tap on a, another slider output level same deal. So those are the sliders for oscillator one. We've got some other things on that screen. Address circuit enable, uh, well I'll explain that later when we go and look at the oscillator setup screen. Trigger, same deal. Mute is what you'd expect. It just basically, if I let this play, I'm muting. There's only one oscillator running so that's what mute does. If you move your attention over to the right hand side of the screen, same deal. We've got three identical squares, rectangles. The top one refers to oscillator 1, the next one oscillator 2, and the bottom one oscillator 3. This is basically giving us control over a filter for that particular oscillator's output. So this filter will go right at the end, I think, of the chain of manipulations. And we also have a delay. Let's look at the, if we look at the filter first, um, the low pass filter is on by default, but the cutoff is set to all the way to the right, so essentially it's not filtering at all. But if we were to vary that cutoff by, if you drag this little red spot, that's by default it's labeled 10 kilohertz, you might wonder what these little trails are when you drag something. Um, don't worry about that for now. If we let this play and we drag the cutoff blob on that 2D grid, dragging it to the left reduces the cutoff um, or increases the cutoff. Dragging it up and down increases or decreases the resonance. So basically we've got an XY pad which is quite a familiar concept from other synths and sound apps uh, to control the high pass, sorry, low pass filter. If we select low, a high pass instead, we've got the opposite. Again, resonance is on the vertical. And we've got a band pass filter. Okay. So that's the filter. The other thing we've got is the delay. So if we, the same deal, if you look at the blob to the bottom left of the screen, We've got a delay blob that we can drag right and left and up and down. If we drag, if we just let that go. Now, by default, that's not doing anything, so we have to select that on. If you look at the legend at the top of that grid, that currently says delay time feedback. If I click one of those buttons next to the word delay, it, it now changes that legend to say delay time 0.004. Uh, to 5 to 0.5. Now that's the range of delay time represented by leftmost and the rightmost edges of that grid. If I click the other button instead it goes from 0.5 to 2 seconds. So now that is delay is selected on. If I click play you can hear that's now got a, an echo on a half second delay. If I move to right that's about 1.3 seconds if I move up, that increases the the feedback. It's not very obvious, actually. Let me um, make it a smaller delay. Okay, so that's delay. You get the idea. That's a familiar concept. There's a couple of other things on there which I'll come back to, referring to a LFO. Before I do that, you'll also notice at the top left of this grid, you've got a little button that says FLT. At the top right, you've got a little button that says DLY. Um, some of these things are not obvious. <laughs> if you double-click 
on that FLT. You get another drill down dialog that allows you to tweak uh, some of the filter settings in more detail. We've got the same auto increment or decrement options that we had before. I think that's all we have. That's the frequency and, and resonance. You'll see actually behind there the blob is moving as I change those sliders. Um, in fact if I close that and if I move that slider to somewhere in the middle and then double click on FLT, yeah the sliders reflect the current position of that blob essentially. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. And same for delay, double click on that, same deal. Now it's not quite the same deal because we have uh, an extra couple of sliders on the delay. We've got two extra sliders and that's because the delay has its own low pass and high pass filters specifically for the delay, uh, I don't know what you call them, the tails, the feedback, um, the delayed signals. Um, can we demonstrate that? We'll try. If we bring up the delay. Doesn't seem to be. Let's just uh, make that a very long delay. Oops. As long as we can. Double click that. We'll put on single delay. Right. You can just about hear a difference there. That's applying a low pass filter to the, the delayed, the single delayed signal. Try a high pass. Yeah, you can hear that as well. So that's the subtlety, you know, like all these things, the utility of that may not be obvious, just having it explained, but you know, there'll be a day when you're trying to make some effect happen and suddenly that will click into place as exactly what you need. <laughs> so that's filter and delay for oscillator 1 and by extension oscillator 2 and oscillator 3 independently. What else? If you look towards the center bottom of this screen, you'll see three more things. Now these three things are not connected specifically to the oscillators. These are three independent LFOs, low frequency oscillators. And you can use these for a number of things. Most immediately you can use them to vary the positions of these oscillators within the 2D soundscape. If we choose just arbitrarily LFO1, that's the one to the left. The rate by default is 10 seconds. It's as low as it goes. If you click the um, depth, let's put that up to, well it's 100% but it's plus or minus 50%. So if we put oscillator one more or less in the middle, if you look down we've got three, so we've got two rows of buttons. The three rightmost buttons represent the oscillator one, two and three. Distance from the side, I, I, these labels are not very clear. I mean it says oscillator side, that means the distance from the side. Um, so it's the left or right or the, the X position, if you like. Uh, and the three buttons below represent the, the distance from front to back. So what this means is if I, if I click the leftmost of those three side buttons, that will link the LFO to the X or left or right position of that oscillator. So when I run play, you'll see that move. Now it's moving on an arc rather than, you know, so it's keeping a constant distance from the listener, but moving left and right. And the period is 10 seconds. 
if I restrict that to about, well, plus or minus 25%, it only moves halfway. If I add in by clicking the leftmost of the three distance buttons, that means oscillator one will now be controlled in the y direction as well, with the same parameters, so the same rate and depth, because they're linked, it's linked, they're linked to the same LFO. So now we'll get a sort of an orbit happening. While that's going, if I double click on the LFO rate button, we get some LFO <laughs> drill down parameters. If I click the rate divided by 10, that, that rate is now speeded up. It's one second. In, is it, did I do that? If I wanted to control the side to side X movement and the up and down or far and near, that's a Z movement really, far and near. Independently, I would let's control the distance with LFO2. So I've got LFO2, which is the central one, and click the distance, the leftmost distance button, um, click that distance to be plus or minus 50%. We should now see those two things vary independently. Let's just change those. Let's change those depths to be something slightly more. Um, I'll make the side to side movement very slight. And I'll make the depth very pronounced. Let's try that. Now that LFO is operating on a sine wave, you can change them to a, a saw wave by clicking the, the saw buttons. It's not hugely significant, but you don't get the deceleration out at the extremes. I'm going to do another thing, which is, you'll see that tail shows where the oscillators where the parameter has been and you see that it's retracing its path exactly every time. If we go into the side to side movement which is controlled by LFO1, if I double click on that LFO there's another parameter called drift. If I click drift you should see that introduces a little bit of noise or imprecision into that left to right oscillator. And so it's not tracking precisely every time the same route. So that just adds a bit of variation. One last thing to say about those LFOs, if you direct your attention back to the top right of the screen and we look at the grid for controlling the filter and the delay, now we can see what these LFO parameters or checkboxes are for. Again, there's three of them. Now again, I'm just going to make a comment here about something to do with the design of this user interface. There's a subtlety here that makes this slightly hard to get your head around, especially if you're exploring this without having read the manual. On this grid, we've got three buttons next to the words LFO frequency. We've got one, one, two, three buttons. And that looks the same as when we look down at the LFO setup itself. Oops. We've got three buttons there. Now those buttons have positional significance but they're not the same significance. Uh, in the LFO setup, the left, center, and right stood for oscillator one, two, and three. In the filter and delay setup against LFO frequency, the left, center, and right buttons have positional significance, but they are selecting the uh, LFO one, two, or three. They're not selecting an oscillator. Now that may or may not make any sense to you, but to me that's, you know, logically speaking, that's, that's the sort of incoherence in the design. Um, having said all that, <laughs> we're going to, let's say, control the low-pass frequency cutoff. Let's put it there by default. 
using OS, using LFO one. So we click the leftmost button to select LFO one, and we should be good to go. Let's just change that depth of that thing to be um, maximum. So we can see that tracking plus or minus 50% with LFO1. And it'll be clipped at the edge there because 50% only makes sense if we start in the centre. There's three buttons to the right labelled resonance. So we can also control the resonance by clicking the appropriate box. If we use the same LFO, both the resonance and the cutoff frequency are varying according to LFO1. Again, if we wanted those to be independent, we could click instead of LFO1 for the resonance, we could click LFO2. They're both set to the same, so I'll just restart it, those tails disappear. So we've got independent control of the LFO frequency, sorry, of the filter cutoff frequency and the resonance. Now the only downside of that is we've got we've only got three LFOs and we have three independent oscillators, each of which has two parameters that we might want to hook up to an LFO. So that's six parameters and only three LFOs. So we do have to do some doubling up at some point. We can't incidentally connect any of the delay parameters to the LFOs. So that pretty much is all we need to know about this main screen for now. So what next? Let's go and look at the setup for a particular oscillator. Let's look at oscillator one. So oscillator one, this looks overwhelmingly complex, but don't despair, it's not as bad as it seems. The first thing we'll look at is how to load in a, a sample. Um, if you look towards the left hand side of the screen, about halfway down it says RAM file, video games drop 0.2 seconds. If you look to the right hand side of the screen, that's where we select that. So we've got a, a dialogue here with a library of well, two things, samples and presets. We're looking at samples at the moment. Cycle through some of these. We've got some animal samples. If you click a one uh, and click play. Click play again to stop it. There you go. If we go to electronic toys, play. Drop your weapon. I like that one. These are all, these are all samples Higher. from little gadgety toys, I think. Uh, so, there you go. Uh, and various other things. There's quite a lot of samples here. Um, just in passing, if you were to select presets instead of samples, a preset for an oscillator is the collection of the sample you've loaded and all the settings that you can see on this screen. Um, so if you, well, we'll look, that doesn't make sense to look at that until we've really looked at what the thing can do. So if we stick with samples for now, and I think we're going to stick with that droplet sound for now, because that's quite a good uh, illustrator. So what else do we have here? Well, hmm, if we click um, solo, that will only play the oscillator that we're looking at. I mean, we only have one oscillator set up at the moment, so that's that's redundant. But if I click play, it plays that through and it repeats. I can, if you direct your attention down to these sliders at the bottom left, I can change the clock speed, which is the playback speed. Now by default that divides the clock speed so it gets slower. If you click the button that says faster, slower, it's actually multiplying. And as we saw on the um, main screen, wherever that clock speed setting is, the clock offset, which is the next slider down, 
varies it from that. Plus or minus. Set that to zero. The other thing you can do is you can click the reverse button. That's what it says in the tin. Stop that for a second. The two sliders immediately below the clock offset are directly related to the clock off offset and they define the actions of a low uh, another <laughs> LFO, low frequency oscillator. It has a default rate of five seconds and can be varied up to 30 seconds. And it has a depth. If the depth is non zero, it will vary that clock offset. So if we vary that clock offset through a depth of plus or minus 50% and then run that you can hear that offset is varying. The only other thing to note about that LFO is if you look at the third button just above the sliders, uh, it's labelled LFO rate divided by 10. That will change that rate from half a second to three seconds. So, oops, so it's going to go much faster. Might be better to choose a different sample actually. Let's, uh, it's a boring tone, but it should show us the LFO slightly better. If we change that to, there's no variation. Play that full speed. So if I now divide the clock rate by 10, so that's what that does. Frequency modulation depth. Let's just briefly, briefly look at this. Let's put back our original sample. In fact, let's not do that. We'll leave this sample in there for a second. Let's just quickly go to, we need to have two samples loaded for this. Well, not technically we don't, but, but for purposes of explanation we do. If I go to oscillator two, by clicking this button right at the top of the screen, you can see I'm switching forwards, backwards and forwards between one and two. Go to oscillator two. If I load a sample into there, I'll, ro I'll load that droplet sample in. If I solo this oscillator two, if I go back to oscillator one, solo oscillator one. Right, if you go down to the bottom left of the screen and there's a slider called frequency modulation depth, and then just to the right of that, there's FM source. This allows you to use a frequency modulation function to combine two samples. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to play our current sample, oscillator one sample, but it's going to mix in, using an algorithm I don't really understand, in some sense, doing frequency modulation. <laughs> it's going to mix in either oscillator one, two, or three. Again, that's positional according to which button you select. So if we select oscillator two, it will do its frequency modulation using that droplet sound. Um, so if I unsolo, this will play both of the sounds. First of all, if I click solo again. We're, ac we're not actually playing that droplet sound, but if I bring that frequency modulation slider gradually up, having selected that as the FM source, we should hear some difference. And if I click off that FM source button, so you can hear that's doing something. And Interestingly enough, we can actually frequency modulate 
ourself <laughs> by, by selecting oscill oscillator one as the source. Um, let's try that. Mm. That's doing something. I don't really know what that's doing. You might um, have a better insight. So what we really need to look at is the heart of this application. I think the most interesting thing and you know, the thing that's going to allow you to make some pretty weird and wonderful sounds is basically centered on this emulation of the addressing of the storage for the sample. And that's what we're looking at with this kind of grid in the center of the screen. Now, <laughs> you, you will hear from time to time people say of a complex or intricate application such as this that you need a computer science degree to understand it. And, uh, you know, in this case, it's it's almost literally true. Really, to make full use of what you can do with this, you need to have some understanding of what's going on. Now, what is going on is we have a block of memory, which is a megabyte. It's addressable, therefore, by 20 independent address lines. It's 2 to the power of 20 is a megabyte. That's 1,024 squared. And what this allows us to do is interfere with the retrieval of the data as the sample plays. So if you imagine that somehow the process of this is emulating is stepping through that memory byte by byte, retrieving each byte and then you know playing the sound that that represents. And it's doing that 11,500 times per second, given the sample rate. But we can muck up those addresses. And so it will retrieve things out of sequence in glitchy kind of ways. So the address lines are this, these, to the left of this diagram, you see A0 to A19. Those are the address lines, notionally. If we let the thing run, let's go and get this droplet sample back in, because I like that better. Now as that runs, you can see those address lines illuminating in complicated and intricate ways. And if you know anything about computers and binary addresses, what, you, what you'll probably recognise is, if you could slow that animation down, what you should see is it's actually counting in binary up from zero to the maximum address um, according to the size of the sample and then recycling to zero. And so it's stepping through the memory retrieving the data for that sample. If you've got a keen eye, you should also notice that it's only stepping through, a, the, the only address lines that seem active are up to about halfway, uh, to address line 11 in fact. Interestingly enough, if you look to the right hand side of that diagram, you can see there's some red flashes there. Those red flashes represent the binary number that is the highest address that's used in storing this particular sample. This is a sample that's not 0.2 seconds long and if you decoded that number I'm not going to do that. I, I will do that because I'm a nerd. Uh, A11 is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1, 2, 4, 2, 4, 8. So it's, it's 2048 plus 64 plus 4 plus 1. So there you go. So that's what's going on when you see those lines flashing as the sample is playing. Now here's the thing, we can stamp on those lines and we can do all sorts of um, <laughs> useful, or in the real world, chaotic things. Now this is supposed to be emulating a thing, if you've heard of a thing called circuit bending. You know, that's basically opening up the back of some electronic device and short circuiting bits of it. Um, particularly, and particularly we're talking about low-cost audio devices and to see what interesting things happen. So you you can short-circuit address lines, people solder resistors across them or variable resistors and so on. That's kind of what this is allowing us to do. If I let this run, if you direct your... Actually, I'll do that in a minute. If you direct your attention to this, this central grid of little squares, if you look at the leftmost column there, we'll concentrate on that. If you click those squares... You're actually selecting them. What you're doing there is you're selecting particular address lines to mess with. And the kind of messing with them that you can do is you can hard hardwire them to one or zero. 
so let's say we want those to be pulled up to ones constantly, which is the default. If you look at this address circuit mode matrix at the bottom, you can see the bottom row of that is selected by default. And it means the default action is to set that line that's selected to one. So it will always be one. Whatever address is selected and for that particular address line, it will it will be overridden and it'll be set to a one. If I if I click the set to zero, it would always be set to zero. So that means that certain addresses will never work properly. Let's let's just hear what that sounds like. Doesn't sound like anything because to enable that we have to go to the top of that column and click address circuit enable. So if I let it run, then I do that. Now it's doing something that sounds very glitchy. If I just toggle some of these on and off. If I toggle them all on, well in fact long before I get there, I mean basically we're only ever getting one address. Uh, which is one 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 one, um, so that's not very helpful. Now you can easily go over the top with this, and you can get some very gross and actually grotesque effects of questionable utility, shall we say? <laughs> uh, I think the trick and the art, really, of using this effectively is to is to get subtlety. Um, you know, it's very easy to get sounds that sound like a, a fax modem or some other kind of very electronic thing. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a very useful effect to mix into your soundscape. So, subtlety is the order of the day. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. We'll go through another example uh, and try and, you know, show, show some of that. Just to extend what we've done here, we've actually got five columns of selectable masks here and we can enable them and disable them independently. Now the reason you might want to do that, you, you, mean, you could set them all on at, at the same time. Got, we've got four of them on there. Now, now that's really pretty much suppressed the whole of that sample, but you can selectively enable and disable them. And actually you can do that from the main screen. If we close this and go back to the main screen, now the purpose of those address circuit enable buttons becomes clear. If we let this run again, we can independently turn those things on and off. And actually the, the significance of that number, they all say one to the left there, but that, that number shows you which algorithm which mangling algorithm you selected. So if we were to select for the the middle three set zero, um, or in fact for the middle one we'll, we'll select above, and we go back to the main screen, you can see those things now. We've got a one, which is the set one algorithm, zero is the set zero algorithm, A is the set above algorithm. I'm not going to tell you what those algorithms mean. You can read about them in the the manual, which is available under this question mark, by the way. Uh, and, and as before, the manual is, you know, it's a passably useful manual. You, you must read this if you want to understand this app. Um, it, you know, it's idiosyncratic, but it's, but it's there, which is more than you can say for many apps. And it's actually pretty good. And it remembers where you were when you reopen it. So that's, that's handy. So that's the purpose of having in five independent address circuits that can be independently enabled or disabled. Now there's another way to use these. There's a column called, if I, if I disable all of those, there's a column labeled trigger enable. So if I enable the leftmost one on trigger um, and run, nothing happens. But if I select on this little checkbox to the left, and below those two sliders called trigger enable you can just about hear a glitch creeping in there it's not 
it's not doing the same thing as it did when the address circuit enable was was on. It's doing something. And actually what it's doing is, if you look, now direct your attention to these two sliders at the top left of the screen, it's doing something according to the setting of those sliders. There's actually a trigger pulse happening every 0.28 seconds. According to that slider. So every 0.28 seconds, that circuit is enabled. Now, the other slider controls how long it stays on. At the moment, it's set to, uh, this is a thing called duty cycle. If we, and that's a percentage. So now that's a percentage of the pulse width, if you like. So just to make that simple, that trigger is triggered every 0.32 seconds. And if we set the duty cycle to 100%, it means that once it's triggered, it stays on until the next trigger for 100% of the, the pulse width, if you like. I think that's what it means. So that should have exactly the same effect as having the address circuit enable selected, I predict. Which it does. But if we wind that duty cycle slider down, the percentage of the time between the pulses that that circuit remains enabled gets progressively smaller. So that allows us to play with the, the, the nature of that effect overall and the detail of that is the extent to which that mangling actually influences the playback of the sample. Now these two sliders are very powerful and very useful things to, to play with. In fact I've hook them up to hardware sliders. I've got an Oxygen 25 keyboard plugged in here which has got a whole bunch of assignable rotary controls. If I just show you how you do that, if you go back to the main screen, go to settings, if you go to assign, that allows you to assign new sliders. So I have my mappings done to control, I think the currently selected oscillator whichever one is currently selected, my sliders will control that. So if I were to select main volume level and then go learn and then tweak the slider on my keyboard, that's now learned that uh, that's what I want to use to control the volume. And you can see that the main volume follows that. If we go back to the setup for oscillator one, you can see that I've got these trigger pulse and duty cycle. They're mapped to my MIDI keyboard. Now let's do this from scratch. Let's go back to the main screen. We'll choose empty scene set. So everything is wiped out. Go into oscillator one. You can, by the way, randomize all of these values by pressing the random button and then God knows what's going to happen. Um, oh, it'd be nice if there's an undo button. There isn't an undo button. Uh, but reset in this case does what I want it to do. If I choose a a sample from the library. I'm going to go to animals. Now I'm going to choose, you know, you'll get a sense of what kind of samples work best for this kind of address mangling. And I'm going to choose some rainforest birds. So if we set that, and the only thing that should be in place in, by way of processing will have reverb on by default if I play that. So that's okay. We can change the clock speed. We'll leave that alone for now. So how would you go about experimenting with this? Okay, well, let's say we want to experiment with the address mangling. Well, you can simply dive right in. Let the sample play. And start let's say enable one of these address mangling circuits and then just start tinkering. 
Now, the problem is, as I said earlier, you know, that is, is certainly mangling the sample in, in a somewhat interesting way, but it's, you know, once it's, once it's in place, it's very samey and uh, really not that subtle at all. There's one extra feature that I haven't mentioned, which really, I think, makes this um, address mangling function much more interesting, and that is that mask doesn't need to be static. Yeah, uh, if you look down to that below that address circuit mode matrix, towards the bottom of the screen, there's another row of buttons called address circuit shift. If we just take in the leftmost address circuit and put one single bit selected, and if we click the corresponding address circuit shift, and then we click play, nothing, nothing immediately obvious happens. If we select off address circuit enable, but instead select trigger on, and then select trigger enable, that mask actually now animates. And it animates according to the trigger pulse width. So the shorter the trigger pulse, the faster it goes. The longer it is, the slower it goes. And again, it responds to the duty cycle. So if I put a large duty cycle, I can put the maximum duty cycle on. And then just play with the pulse width. Now that's already more interesting. But then we can tinker with the duty cycle as well. Now don't forget that the, the, the settings of those two things const, constantly interact. So if you change the pulse width, the, the meaning of the duty cycle in terms of seconds or milliseconds actually changes. Um, so that's, that's not an obvious interplay. So, I mean, that's why it's so helpful to have these on hardware knobs because you can just tinker them little bits repeatedly without having to slide your finger about on the screen. The other thing you can do is, which for this sample, arguably, it's not that important. If you look at uh, towards the centre and bottom, there's a whole bunch of other sliders. That, there's a one there called gate threshold and gate release. If we let the sample run, I've turned the trigger off for now. So there's no mangling going on. If you let that run, and I change the gate threshold. Again, I've got this on a slider. I'll turn it all the way up progressively. It, it's like a squelch control. You know, it's, it's, it's cutting out the sample playback when it's below a certain volume, if you like. Now the other parameter is the gate release. When it cuts out and then cuts back in, uh, it's very abrupt because we've got a very short gate release. If we wind that up, it kind of smooths out the sample. Might be more obvious if we chose a different um, sample for this. Let's choose and try and choose one that's kind of noisy. We'll try that one. That's, that's got some background noise. So we'll turn the threshold right down. Play that. If we progressively turn up the gate, you can see it's cutting in and out. And that's very obvious because the, the background hiss disappears as well. And we can tinker with how abruptly it does that by changing the gate release be longer. So that's like the release tail on an ADSR envelope. So if we then put our trigger and animated mask uh, address mangler on, and we tinker with that, 
that's given us something already that's slightly interesting. If we, let's say, put a couple of extra bits in there. Something else we might try is to reverse the sample. Perhaps change the clock speed very slightly. So you can see the quality of that sound is beginning to change in a relatively subtle way and it's not sounding like that modem gone mad, you know, very obvious address mangling. If we just let that run we could try again tweaking the algorithm by changing from set 1 to set 0 or set above. So you can imagine if we were to then load in a second sample to oscillator 2, let's go for, so that's the birds in spring sample, let's go with the, so we'll set that in there. Uh, what we can do incidentally is if we go back to oscillator 1, if we click copy, that copies all the settings, if we go to oscillator 2 and paste, that pastes all the parameters, including the RAM, the sample actually so we have to reset reselect that sample okay so if we solo oscillator 2 which is the droplet but with the address mangling copied across change the, the pulse width a little bit so it's out of step with the with the other one Let's change the duty cycle. That's pretty good, I like that. Let's change the algorithm. is going to do any not much use on this one okay if we let now oscillator one back in and change the relative sound balance that a bit Well, you know, it's not immediately an aesthetic masterpiece, but you can see we get, we're starting to layer those sounds in with some glitching uh, in a relatively subtle kind of way. I won't say too much more about the, the nuances of that. If you look below where it says trigger enable, we've got a whole bunch of options. You can look at the documentation to, to figure out specifically what they do. So that's all we're going to look at in great depth. We're going to look at the rest of what's on this screen just by way of overview, really. If we look to the right of this grid where we've been looking at the address mangling, we've got a couple of other things. We've got kind of a chain. It's, it's laid out as a kind of a flow chart. So we go from the address mangling into a thing called pulse width modulator. Now, I have to confess, I don't really understand in great depth what this does. But if you just look at it in terms of it's another way to mess about <laughs> with the the output before it gets to the filter and the delay. A definite grittiness coming in there. So if we just keep that sample for now, if we look down uh, next, we've got this pulse width modulator de degradation. Let's do something that sounds like some sort of, some sort of filtering. 
it's definitely in some shape. And that has a, a parameter, this pulse per sample, which looks like a parameter to that, if we see what that is. And so on. Then after that, there's a noise chain. Uh, invert it. We can invert the signal. Whatever that means. Then we can introduce noise. Let's try. Let's try. Suggest what it's going to do. I think we've got different noise algorithms. Okay, so really I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say too much more about that. You can experiment with those things, you can read about them. What else can we do? Let's look at the last thing on this screen that I'm going to look at, which is the amplitude modulation. That's a very simple function. If we just stick with this, uh, let's, in fact, let's press reset. Let's reset all the parameters, but kept the sample. Drop your weapon, drop your Amplitude modulation basically varies the amp. This is essentially a low frequency oscillator. It varies the amplitude or the volume, in other words, of the sound on a sine wave. Well, by default, a sine wave. If you look to the bottom center of the screen, you can select a triangular wave. We'll, we'll leave it with sine wave for now. And we'll put Let's see, depth to 100, amplitude modulation frequency is 0 0.1 hertz. So that's going to be, well, if it was 1 hertz, it would vary a complete cycle in one second. So it's one cycle in 10 seconds. So it should, with a depth of 100%, it should fade that sample in and out uh, over a cycle of 10 seconds. Your weapon, drop 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 your weapon, and that's what it seems to be doing. Your weapon, drop 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 your weapon, drop. That's essentially what amplitude modulation is going to do for you. So let's just look at creating a scene from scratch using, I'm going to use a vocal sample because that's quite an interesting thing to do. Again, if we go on to oscillator one and we go to, if I go to user samples. What folly has put men so far? So, I mean, it's a long sample. What folly has put men? So it's playing there just with. What folly has put men so far reason. beyond reach? In perpetual twilight, where okay. for the dark adapted eye, Neptune's pale arch is the only... I'm going to put a single bit on in that first address mask. We're going to put trigger, trigger enable, and then see how that sounds when we run it. What folly has put men so far oh, beyond reach? In perpetual twilight, where for the dark adapt. The part I missed there was to put on the address circuit shift. I want that mask to to roll, roll around. What folly has put men so far beyond reach in perpetual twilight, where for the dark adapted eye, Neptune's pale arch is the only blue sky. It is the coldest place ever found, and remote, a dark anthem removed by human standards, four hours at the speed. So we want to try putting a few extra Bits in there. What folly has put men so far beyond the and in perpetual twilight? That where for the dark and the that Nixon arms be out our shit is in only blue. We're going to try reversing the. Right away, that sounds. It's clearly speech, but because it's reversed, it sounds it's unintelligible. It sounds like Russian or some Slavic language or German. 
If I jump ahead and actually replace this with some presets I've done along these lines, if we load that one in. Yeah, I'm incorporating some of these other mangling things without really knowing quite what they're doing, but it's given us the effect of, you know, layering extra complexity on top of it. I think if we go and load the other one, we've gone a bit further still. <laughs> and there's we've put in some of these other things, pulse width modulation, we've got noise in there, we've got an amplitude modulator which is fading in and out. So there it is. I think that's all we'll do with Soundscaper for now. This is a crazy uh, application. Uh, but very intricate and very fascinating as well and you can get some absolutely wild sounds from it and you ought to be able to put those sounds to good use in your own projects.